you know, usually I get ready for a message or a sermon or whatever you call it, and, and I'm going a, a certain direction, and often I need to be on my feet. I want to be moving around. It's a lot of energy, and literally this doesn't have a lot of energy. This heavy on my heart. Almost like I think about very seldom have family meetings at the house. But it's like we got to sit around the table and talk about something that's important so people have a chance to ask questions, answer questions. So that's my mom come up here. Uh, and she's going to be a monitor. And she's going to think of all the questions I have. She's going to interrupt me and ask more questions. Uh, honestly, though, she's going to be asking some questions as I'm talking about our topic for the morning. If you've got her phone number or you got my phone number and you have a question while I'm talking this morning, text us and we're going to answer those questions about this topic. Number two, if you don't have our phone numbers, but you got a sheet of paper, you can actually scribble out a note and I'll have, at the end, I'll have one of the deacons come gather up any questions. Um, so this is a heavy topic and this is the title. Here we go. I think some of you are probably nervous. Like, oh no. <laughs> Here's the title. Sin repentance, forgiveness, confession, and other man-made mysteries of Christianity. Now, I put it this way because the church over the last 2,000 years, depending on, what, depending on what denomination, what background you have, have made up some things. There are some made-up things that are not biblical about sin, repentance, forgiveness, and confession, and I think it's something we are not talking enough about as a body. I think in 2019, just the topic of sin is one of those things that you don't necessarily want to touch as a preacher. And I believe just in this room alone, I could go through and go, hey, give them a list and say, is this sin? And some would say yes, and others would say no, because some of the social doctrine has been, well, it was sin back then, but it's no longer sin. Somebody's already texting you. Uh oh. You gonna turn your ringer off? Oh, my brother's texting me back. Yeah, my brother said thank you. It's my brother's birthday. He's an old man today. So, sin, forgiveness, confession, repentance, let's talk about it. First, I wanna start with a quiz, okay? And we're gonna take a quiz, and I'm not gonna make you turn this in. You don't even actually have to write it down. I just wanna kinda have you use your fingers on this first one. And so, to yourself, in your head or on your fingers or fingers and toes, I want you to think, and you're going to have to answer this out loud. How many times have you sinned since you woke up this morning? <laughs> There's one. <laughs> How many times have you sinned since you woke up this morning? So show of hands. More than 20, raise your hands. If you, if you thought, I mean, you've got already there, more than 20, raise your hand. Oh, good. More than 10, raise your hand. Oh, oh, watch him. Okay. More than five, raise your hand. Okay. And zero. Raise your hand if you've sinned zero times this morning. No, oh, just like flat out zero. Oh, you got, okay, zero to five. Okay. And then zero. All right, now next question. How many acts of righteousness have you committed this morning? How many acts of righteousness have you committed this morning? Now raise your hand, more than 20. Oh, 10, more than 10, okay. More than five. Uh-huh, and zero to five. So here's the problem. This is out of a book. This is straight out of the first page of Turkeys and Eagles by Peter Lord. Peter Lord, who wrote this book in the 80s, claims that the church has us so fouled up that when we get asked this question, I could say, how many times have you sinned today? And people will say, many people will say, I've sinned 10 times. And then when asked the next question, how many acts of righteousness, they will just divide by two. And they will say five. And if I say, okay, now list them, nobody can actually list the sins they've committed today, nor the acts of righteousness. The thing is this, we just think we're half as good as we are bad. How many of you, show of hands, could literally tell me 
the sins that you raised your hands for? All, like if you said five, that you could raise your hand and tell, I don't want you to do it, but you could tell me all five of those. See? You raise your hand? You could. Okay. Here's the deal. Next question in the quiz, Peter Lord asked, can you sin and not know it? And in the quiz, I wrote, well, of course, yes. And then he shows me scripturally where the answer is, if you're a Christian, it's not possible. How is it not possible? You know, I'm sitting there going, what do you mean you can't sin and not know it? And he said, what kind of father do you think we have? That he sends you a Holy Spirit to convict you of sin, but he wouldn't convict you of all of them. What kind of dad do you think you have that wouldn't tell you every time that you sin? And so the reality is, if you're born again, the Holy Spirit convicts you every time you sin. Our problem is that we wake up every morning and we think of ourselves as sinners. The Bible is very clear that you are sinners. Now, as much as, as much as I hate to say this, I have a granddaughter here who's nine months old. Okay? And as many people would like to say, oh, babies are born pure, they're born wonderful, they're born without sin. The truth is, biblically speaking, um, all she does... Hi, sweetie. She's looking at me. She's like, you're talking about me. All she does right now in life is selfish. She doesn't do anything that's righteous because right now she's the Lord of her life. She wasn't born a Christian. She can't be born a Christian. And everything she does, she wants to be fed. She wants to be played with. She wants to be talked to. And so literally, she is doing her own thing until she gets confronted by the Holy Spirit and gets born again. Okay? And so we look at sin as like evil things or nasty things or bad things, but the truth is that's not exactly what sin is. So now I want to pause. Do you have anything to ask me yet? I'm thinking. My okay. brain is thinking about I think I leave holes in stuff, and I don't explain everything yes. so good. No, I think, I think this is good to talk about sin. I don't, I don't like talking about sin. You know, I we mean, don't honestly, like talking about sin. And especially in church because I think, oh, it's offensive. Yeah, right. To my human nature, it's talking to about my flesh. Absolutely. Talking about sin is very offensive, so I don't like talking about it. I, I would like you to define sin, and, and is that on here? Okay. That's it. That's my next question. What is sin? Okay, I do want to. In the Old Testament, it's C H A T T A, A T H, which is pronounced katoth. Okay, so the Old Testament word for sin is katoth, and it means condition of sinfulness. Or to do what is wrong. Like it has a double meaning in the Old Testament, just like it does in the New Testament. So there's like a list of sins, and then there's just being in the sinful condition. Okay? New Testament, the word is hamartia, which tends to explain sin a little bit better. Hamartia is a word that archers use. And it's when they shoot at a target and they miss the mark. Often, we think sin is simply a list of things you shouldn't do. They're bad things, don't do them. They're unethical, they're immoral, don't do that, okay? Hey, Martia says that God's an archer, and you're an arrow, and he's shooting you at a target, and if you miss the target, that's sin. You want me to turn your ringer off? <laughs> so, who is it? Oh, oh I see it. I want to read it. Okay, good. We will. So this is acts of sin versus acts of righteousness. So hamartia is missing the mark. So like to me as a little boy, if you steal, that's sin. And I'm in agreement with that. Okay, that is a sin. If God tells you to go give somebody food and you don't do it, that's also sin. Not, you know, doing what God's told us not to do is sin. And not doing what God's told us to do is sin, which is missing the mark. Now back to this sinner versus saint mentality. The other, the next question of the book, it says, are you a sinner or are you a saint? And he says like 90% of Christians circle sinner because we've been trained to say, I'm a sinner saved by grace. And the truth is, if you're born again, you were a sinner. And now you're a saint or a son a daughter, a child of God. And so one of the things Peter puts in this book that's, that's, uh, that's good for me is it says that if I'm a sinner, and that's my name, then everything I do 
is basically sin. I'm in a condition of sin. But if I'm a saint, everything I do that's not against God's will is an act of righteousness. There's the answer to the question. And so take Bree here. My daughter-in-law changes the diaper for our granddaughter. Because she's a born-again believer, that's an act of righteousness. It's what God's asked her to do. So, so now the question is, how many acts of righteousness have you committed today? You can start counting poopy diapers. <laughs> or just the things we do. Fixing breakfast is an act of, act of righteousness. Uh, saying I love you or giving kind eyes to your family. or I mean, really just basically anything you do during the day that's not against God's will is you being in righteousness. Now, now we got to... now. I'm always saying, all right, we've got to look and know that there is a list of sins. We know that that is sin, and that is sin, and that is sin. But you can actually be living by the rules and have a condition of sin if Jesus is not your Lord. If you're living by the rules, and that's what Jesus is explaining to the rich young ruler, is like, yeah, you're going by the rules, but you're still your Lord. I'm not your Lord, and so that's the condition of sin. So I think you should tell the story a little bit, just a version of the rich young ruler in case somebody out there doesn't know. So rich young ruler is a young man who's got some, um, apparently some political clout or he's got a name in town. He comes to Jesus and he says to Jesus, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus says to him, he says the 10 commandments, he says, you need to five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, which are uh, don't kill, don't steal, don't lie, don't covet, don't commit adultery, honor your mother and father. Not in that order. And, Jesus, and the guy says, I do that. I live by the rules. Okay? And then Jesus says, well, now all you need to do is sell everything you've got, give the money to the poor, come and follow me, which is basically one, two, three, and four. Have one God, no idols, honor the Sabbath, keep it holy. Uh, one God, no idols, holy name, honor my name. Okay, holy name, holy day. So he's saying, you're living by the rules from your perspective, but I'm not your Lord. Therefore, you're not a son. It's, it's religion versus relationship. Relationship, or what, what God did, is he sent Jesus to build a bridge. Jesus covers my sin. It's not that I don't sin anymore. It's my name's no longer sinner. I still sin, and Jesus paid for those sins. And so Jesus is the bridge from me to God. Religion is when man builds a bridge. There was a time in church history. It's an ugly time in church history. It's around the Martin Luther days, you know, prior to that. I don't know the years, but in the Catholic church, uh, there were people dying, and family member would come into the priest and say, hey, did, did my uncle go to heaven? And the priest would say, actually, no. He's not in hell. He's in between heaven and hell. And if you'll go put a gold coin on the first 18 steps then we'll pray him into heaven. You can pay for his sin. And it's called penance. And so it's not celebrated exactly the same way today, but all of a sudden, priests were adding a new way to get to God. The Pharisees were adding new ways to get to God. They said, you want to get to God? You got to go this way. Jesus comes on the, on the scene and says, I'm the only way. There is no other way but through me. Now, I wanted to talk about our brother Arthur for Oh, brother, where art thou for a moment? There's, uh, if you haven't seen that movie, great movie, but those three guys had broken out of jail and they hear these people singing and they're going to a baptism scene and, and all of a sudden, oh, uh, was it Delmar? Delmar runs down to the water and he gets, he gets baptized and comes out and he, and he comes back to George Clooney, um, who, Everett. He comes back and he goes, I've been born again. I've been saved by the blood of Christ. And he, and he says, he, he, he forgave me for knocking over that piggly wiggly is what Delmar says. And then Everett says, you told me you didn't knock over that piggly wiggly. And then uh, Delmar says, well, I was lying. And he forgave me for that too. And so this idea that forgiveness, like whenever I receive Jesus, that forgiveness, that blood goes all the way back. It's present and it's all the way future, which is why this, we move from sin to confession or sin to repentance. And it gets a little confusing. Uh, I remember being a little kid praying at night. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake. That's a five-year-old praying. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. I thought 
that if I didn't confess every sin that I'd committed that day and I died, I would go to hell. Turns out, if I had died at night, I would have gone to hell, but it wouldn't be because I didn't confess all those sins. It was because Jesus wasn't my Lord, okay? I was fearful that I needed to keep up with this list so that I could turn in this list, and after I went through the list, I'd be okay. I was confused. So I remember, just I'm going to add this real quick. <clears throat> I remember thinking, like, you had, this is a, a non-Christian. If you go to church, though, like some of your, like it was almost a good and a bad list. Naughty, nice type Santa Claus list. I mean, my theology was just all messed up. But I thought, well, if you sin and do bad stuff, but then you go to church on Sunday, it kind of, kind of would wipe off some of it. Right. I mean, I kind of thought that. I, am I, do you think I'm the only one that thought that? I think we all think that. I mean, I think that's real. <laughs> like I get extra points or a star by my name in heaven. Right. I, f I feel like there's a, like we feel like there's this cosmic poster board uh -huh. that's been drawn out and you get stars and frowny faces. And I mean, that's just kind of how, yeah. that's kind of how our minds work. And so we lean that way. I thought God was happier with me when I went to church. I, I did. I thought, oh, if I go to church, like, God is happy with me and things were going to, almost like luck. Like, I would have better luck in the week if I went to church on Sunday. Karma. Karma. That's not a thing. <laughs> so, Micah, we're going to get Old Testament real quick. I want to talk about some of where this doctrine comes from. Micah 719 says this. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. This word iniquities would be would be same as sin okay he will subdue our iniquities and then it says you will cast all our sin into the depths of the sea another version says the sea of forgetfulness and so in the old testament we find out god is going to throw our sin into the sea of forgetfulness and so as a born again believer that's good i like that i can grab a hold of that and so it's like ah so i do whatever i want it goes in the sea of forgetfulness is that that ticket of licentiousness? Yes. And do whatever I want? Right. It's thrill? a license, license to sin. Okay. Isaiah 118 says this. God will make our scarlet sins as white as wool. So Old Testament, it's, it's prophesied. He's going to come and counteract sin. He's going to take it away. Uh, Psalm 103.12 says that he puts our sin or he has removed our sin as far as the east is from the west which is cool if you're into geography. If you leave here and go north, you can go all the way to the North Pole and then your next step is south, right? That's measurable. But if you leave here and go west, you never get east. So as far as the east is from the west means it never ha it's gone. It's obliterated. And so the understanding that sin is gone is a good understanding. However, if we get into the place where we don't ever repent, we don't ever confess, and we don't ever uh, forgive, we're missing out on some of God's blessing. That's, that's where this thing gets confusing. It's like, well, what is it? Do I need to confess all my sins, or are all my sins covered? And I'm like, that's a good question. So what's the answer? What the answer is, John 16 says that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict us of sin and righteousness, okay? So even though you're born again, and your sin is covered, the Holy Spirit's going to convict you. Why? Do you want me to answer? Yes. So I can repent. Why? Because it's good for me. There's the answer. Yeah. So just like our little granddaughter, the first time she wants to crawl over and touch the fireplace or crawl over and touch a hot pot, and we say no, and she's like, why are you trying to control me? She probably won't be able to say that, but little girls already know that. Why are you so controlling? And, and we're going to say, it's not that we're controlling. It's that we don't want you to hurt yourself. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin because sin hurts us. It hurts our relationships, but it doesn't make us not saved. I think too often we get confused and we look at an issue of, well, did I lose my salvation or not? And it's like, that's not the issue. You are still a child of mine, even though you touch the fireplace. But you're going to get burned every time you touch the fireplace. And so I'm going to warn you and say, stop doing that. Going down that road leads to bad things, leads to hurt. 
So now let's get to confession real quick. I want to talk about this. James 5.16 says this, and I think this one's really important for you to hear today. Therefore, confess your sins to each other. Another version says one to another. And pray for each other that you may be healed. So in some denominations, you go in and you confess to a priest. In other denominations, I had a cousin, had some cousins, and they, they had committed some sin, and then they got to come stand before the whole church and tell everybody. Okay? The scripture says one to another. Other denominations just don't even practice confession at all. Now, we don't practice confession like I don't have a little slot and deal and you come tell me, okay? And I don't even need you to come tell me. But I believe that some of us are not healed. See, the verse says, not so that you can be saved and not so you can be forgiven. Forgiveness and salvation aren't even on the table when we're born again. What's on the table is healing. Some of us aren't healed because we're carrying the load of a sin we've committed. The Holy Spirit convicted us, but we just haven't told anybody. And you don't tell somebody so that they can forgive you. You tell somebody so that you can go, oh, I don't have to carry that anymore. And somebody can pray with me and I can be healed. Some of you need to hear that this morning. Some of you have committed sin and you are carrying the weight of that. Your salvation's not on the line. Your forgiveness is not even on the line. You've been forgiven. But you're weighted down because you haven't shared that with someone you trust. Share it with someone you trust. Don't share it with just a group of people that are going to post, put it on Facebook, shun you, turn their back on you, be mean or belligerent or evil to you. Share it with somebody that's in Christ that you can trust so that you may have healing. That was clear? Okay. Matthew 18, 15, and Luke 17 says this when it comes to sin. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, Go to them. Mm. How about this? Again, salvation's not on the line. Forgiveness is not on the line. Relationships on the line. If you sin against me, and it says against me, it doesn't say if you sin. We need to be clear. There are people that like to hot dog and just go to everybody. Hey, you're in sin. You're in sin. You're in sin. It says if they sin against you, go to them. How many of you have had someone sin against you and you refused to go to them? Now, don't lie. That's all of us. We've all done that. How did that relationship go? Strained at minimum and lost at maximum. Right. God tells us to go to each other. And, and in Matthew, it actually says, go to them, just you. And if they won't repent, you go back with a brother and if they won't repent, you go back with church leaders. There, there's a three way, you know, three, three levels of that. And I've never even been to third level. Like, I, you know, once I started practicing this. And practicing this means, hey, you know what? You said something the other day that hurt me. I need to talk about it because it hurt me. And most of the time, this person goes, I had no idea. I didn't mean to do that. I'm sorry. Or actually, I meant to do that. And I'm sorry. Rarely does it even go to level two. Most of the time, when you go to people, it clears the air and they say, I'm sorry. And they're like, thank you so much for coming to me. Problem in America is we don't just not go to people and keep it to ourselves. We go to somebody else. If you come to my office and tell me somebody sinned against you, my first question is always this. What did they say when you went to them? And then you say, well, I didn't go to them. You can't go to them. Well, I can't come to me either over this you've got to go to them we rob people of the ability to make relationships right to come around the corner to fix things yes we've had somebody ask for an example like what would that look like an example of somebody doing something and then going to them give a few examples of sinning against someone and then going to them okay so since i started practicing this I'm going, to do, I'm going to do both sides because I'm going to go ahead and go to the next verse. Wait. Matthew 5 says, if I sin against you. If I sin against you and then I'm bringing my gift to the church, if I'm bringing my offering and I remember I sinned against you, 
it says drop the offering, don't put it in the box, go deal with it, and then come back and give. Okay, so I'm going to give some examples on both sides. I've had some times whenever maybe I heard somebody saying something about me or I heard it from somebody else that they were saying something about me and I'll go to them and I'll say, hey, we need to talk. Uh, do you have time? And I try to, I do it face to face. I don't want to do it over the phone. I don't want to do it through text. Do you have time to talk? And I bring them in. I say, all right, here's what I heard. Can you tell me what's going on here? And often I find out, oh, that's not what I meant at all. That, that's been twisted and mixed up. I mean, I find out that I made some assumptions. Now, get this, Acts 21, 29. If you'll go read in Acts 21, you'll find out that some of the believers saw Paul walking with a guy who wasn't a believer down, he, down the street. They watched it. The Bible says in 21, 29, they assumed he took him into the, uh, not the sanctuary, but the, um, yeah, the temple. It says they assumed he took them into the temple. Because of that, he ended up splitting ways with those guys and having to go in front of the, having to go in front of the king. I mean, it's, and it uses the word assumed. I find out often when I go to somebody that either I assumed something, the middle person assumed something, and I've had it to where the person who's saying stuff about me has assumed something. I got to do one of these this week. I don't want to, it's too new and it's too local for, but I went in, we sit down and I said, hey, I heard something, you said this, I don't think you know the whole story. And then at the end of it, they're like, I didn't know the whole story, I'm glad we talked. And then I said at the end of this meeting, I said, I want you to know I have an open door. If you think something about me or assume something or hear something, come to me because sometimes, and I do stuff. I mean, I sin against people, I offend people, I hurt people, I mean, I, I do that. But sometimes you don't have all the information and maybe if you get all the information, you're going, oh, uh, now the one where I went to somebody, my brother and I, um, this was been about two years ago, we got into a huge, huge, awful face-to-face -face fight. And it's because I had been lying to him. And so I had been lying to my brother and not telling him we were trying to avoid some circumstances with confrontation. him. Confrontation. Yes. We were avoiding confrontation. And this particular one, JB was going to spend the night and at my dad's house and then found out my brother was gonna be there and I didn't want JB spending the night and so I told my son, I said, I'm gonna go basically lie to my brother and tell him you have to work tomorrow and he didn't. And I used you, Sheldon, in the lie. I need you to know this. I said, he's gonna go work for Sheldon. So I lied about JB and Sheldon. And You're a pastor. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then this turned into a big old blow up. Yeah. And as, as we're yelling at each other, he says, why don't you just tell me the truth? And, and, and finally, he got me to say a lot because a lot. I mean, I, went, and I, I did. I lied. And he goes, you're a pastor. And I'm like, yeah, and I, I sinned also. <laughs> you know, that didn't keep me from making mistakes and doing things. I had been lying, and I said, I am sorry. You didn't want to hurt his feelings. I, I had a good reason telling, or what I thought was a good reason. Right. You, yes. Just, I you were I, justifying. I didn't want to be honest. I'm justifying my sin. Right. But I had sinned, and it finally got me. It finally trapped me. It finally, we were in this big blow up, and I said, I will never do it again. Instead of saying... He can't spend the night with you there because we don't like some choices you've made and you don't want to go down that road. Yep. We wanted to keep our kids kind of protected from that. Right. So we didn't say, hey, here's why. We didn't, and I think we all do that. I mean, I think we all have those things where we don't tell because it's hurt, you know, it's hurtful. We don't want to be hurtful, so we don't say it. Right. But this had gone quite far and hurt his feelings right. even worse. And I've been doing it for years. And so now I'm just, I'm just honest on that one. You know, um, I'm just, I'm like, I'm just going to, if I'm feeling it, I say it. So that's, that's what it, excuse me, that's what it looked like. I had a question here. Okay. Uh, so this, this question says, can a Christian, or as a Christian, can you ignore the Holy Spirit to the point that you can't hear it? Yes. Yes, you can. Where is that? It's about grieving and so, quenching. Yeah, late, late. Late New Testament says, don't quench the Holy Spirit, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And so you can ignore so much that you're just going blah, 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 blah. Uh, I believe he's still coming after us. He's still trying to get through to us. But yeah, it's scriptural that you can ignore until you can't hear him anymore. Only, here's the, here's the trick, the funny thing. In my office, have people come in, they're like, I don't know what to do. Uh, uh, this happens all the time. And I'll say, what's God telling you? 
And 100% of the time, people can tell me exactly what God's telling them. So I think they're ignoring it. I don't know that they can't hear it. I think they're refusing to hear it. Um, but I think deep down, they know exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, here was a question. Another one said, what's the age of accountability? So the age of accountability is a phrase uh, that's used in some churches to describe when a person gets old enough to make the decision to follow Christ. And so my um, experience with the age of accountability, that's not a biblical term or biblical phrase. Uh, my experience is that I had a couple of my kids at three and four years old start asking questions. They were eager to understand and to begin following Jesus. And I had other children of mine that were probably five and six before we had that conversation. I, I don't know that you can't be uh, adolescents, uh, adolescent 12, 13. I think, I think the kicker is this in that question. Are they living in a home where they're hearing about Jesus? I think if they're 12 or 13 before they're asking, it's often because they're living in a home where you're not talking about it. I think uh, we as parents are the ones that should be ministering to our kids, but there's no like hard, straight up age. Uh, but Hadley will hear about the love of Christ, and one day she's going to come in and say, hey, what do I need to do uh, to make that happen? So age of accountability is a, um, it's a, it's a doctrinal phrase that's not from the Bible, and the Bible does not address it. Can you hear the Holy Spirit again after you have ignored it for so long? Again, I, I say he follows us so passionately and recklessly and relentlessly, like the song says, that he'll find new ways for you to hear him, that he will, that he will speak in, in louder ways. So, yes. Yes, you can hear him. Yes. yes. After. Yes. You've ignored him for so long. Do you think that that requires something on our part, though? I know Richard Humphreys, Pastor Richard, when he was here speaking, he said, it would be better for you to humble yourself before the Lord, because if he has to humble you, it won't be pretty. And that really struck me, because I don't want to be humbled by the Lord. Well, here, he's such a loving father. It's not about meanness or control, yep. but he's such a loving father that he's going to humble me yep. when I get full of myself. Yep. And so... My example is this. Mm -hmm. What was your grandma, 80 when she got saved? Something, 82 maybe. Prior to grandma getting saved, I would have told you she was past the point of hearing. Sure. My, my, my belief changed when I watched that happen because I thought for all those years, well, she's, she's pushed God back. She didn't want to hear him. And then, and then here she was, 82, getting saved. And so apparently he'll chase you all the way into your 80s. Yes, absolutely. But as Christians, what do you think? As Christians, as Christians, he doesn't give up on us. Yeah, he does. He's going to keep pursuing us. We can keep turning our backs, keep running away. He says about that lost son when he came back, he opened those doors and let him in. I just I am so optimistic and have so much hope mm -hmm. that I don't think he's given up on us. I agree. In fact, I think sometimes if you have some major accident and you're going, I should have died. I don't know why I didn't die. I think there's one or two reasons that happened. Number one, you have a purpose you haven't fulfilled yet. Number two, he's still trying to get your heart because he's not wanting you to die without him. Okay, that's good. Did we ever define acts of righteousness? Did you ever do that? Are you going to? We'll get back to that. So hold on, I'm reading this. Okay, so this one says, I said at five years old, uh, I would have died um, and gone to hell was that my belief of the truth. So here, here's what, I started praying, I started having the wrong um, theology at five. What I'm saying, I don't know, I, I didn't get saved until 20, and I'm saying sometime between five and 20, I was hearing the message, and I just didn't respond to it. And I, I said that, I said that if I had died, but then the truth is he didn't let me die, because he was still, he was still working on me. So. Um, I know I wasn't saved in my teen years. But God protected you. Because and he kept he protecting me and pursuing me. So that's hard. To, it, it, what's hard for me to say is that he would have let me die before I had a chance to make that decision. Okay, now what was your question? Righteousness, acts of righteousness. How would you describe or define acts of righteousness? So I did. I'll okay. go back and do, do it again. again it's, any, it. it's anything we do 
in the blood of Jesus. It's, after we're born again, it's anything we do that's not sin. Everything you do is Wash righteous. Wash my hands, cook dinner. Because you are a son. Or daughter. Right. It's kind of like saying the prince, okay, over in England. What does he do that's not royal? Go to bars and party. and Everything he does is royal. <laughs> okay. Because of his sonship. <laughs> okay. He's a royal person, so wherever he's at, okay. that's royal. I had somebody text up here that said they quit listening to God for 15 years. Oh, wow. And they hear him just fine right now. I won't point any fingers, but. That's good stuff. Yep. This question, this is good. So the New Testament says you must be bat baptized to be saved. Okay, So really good question. This is a whole sermon, but there's four baptisms we read about. The word baptized doesn't mean water alone. Okay, So Jesus tells the disciple in Matthew 28, they said, Can one of us sit at your right one of us sit at your left? And Jesus says to them, Can you be baptized with the baptism I'm about to be baptized with? This is after his water baptism. He was talking about his baptism into, the, into death and raised from the dead. The word baptism means to go under and to come back up. And so in the Bible, here are the four baptisms we see. The first one's the baptism of repentance. When I know I need to be born again, so I die to myself, I say, Jesus, be my Lord. That's baptism number one. Baptism number two is water baptism, which is like a wedding ring. You can literally be married without a ring. But it's more honorable to have a ring to show the world that we're married. So baptism two is water baptism, and it's a baptism of obedience. Okay? Baptism three, uh, Jesus says, Holy Spirit's going to come and baptize you in the Holy Spirit. These were all believers that had been baptized into Jesus, baptized in water, and now they have a third happening. They're baptized into the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus says the fourth baptism is a baptism, baptism of death and resurrection. And so... You must be baptized to be saved, meaning you must die to yourself and ask Jesus to be your Lord. If you're saved, you should quickly get water baptized because it tells the world what's happened on the inside. Okay, anyone who wanders away from his teaching has no relationship with God, but anyone who remains in the teaching of Christ has a relationship with both the Father and the Son, 2 John 1.9. And so, again, this, this is proving what I'm trying to say. So, anyone who wanders away from his teaching has no relationship with God. It's the story of the son who leaves the home. You wander away, and that relationship is broken. But as soon as you come back, you get to live with the Father in the place. So, we have made this sin thing an issue of salvation, not salvation. Uh, born again, not born again, forgiven, not forgiven. I'm telling you, when you get born again, Jesus' blood's enough to cover your sin, past, present, and future. And you don't have to walk in that. You can walk outside of that, and he's going to be drawing you back in. But when we don't repent, and repent means literally turn and go the other way. When you're going to touch the fireplace, and Grandpa says, no and you turn the other way, that's what repentance looks like. When we don't repent, and when we don't confess one to another, we ruin relationships on earth. Do you think people confuse uh, confession with repentance? Or, Absolutely. Or uh, what would that be, an I'm sorry or apologetic attitude right. with repentance? Confession is I'm saying it. I did this. Whatever it is, I did that. And confession is healthy. Yes. Again, one to another. It is not healthy to go confess things to groups of people. That's, that's just not healthy. It says one to another. And so I confess one to another, and I am able to be healed after that. Repentance is when I walk away, because there's sometimes we confess things. Yeah, I did that. I did that. I did that. Repentance is saying I did that. It's wrong. I'm not going to do that anymore. And there is the difference between those of us who sin and those of us who choose sin. Choosing sin says, you may think that's wrong. The Bible may say that's wrong. God may say that's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway because I'm going to do what I want to do. And that's the problem with committing a sin versus choosing a lifestyle of sin. 
got, I got the question here, once saved, always saved, which is another uh, church phrase, okay? That's not a biblical thing. Um, so the idea of once saved, always saved is that once I get saved, no matter what I do, I'm going to be saved. So biblically speaking, Paul says, or Paul says one thing and then John says another thing that adds to this. So Paul says it's better that you never knew Christ than to know him and walk away from him, okay? Another verse uh, in, in Revelation says, and he blotted their names out from the book of life. And so that verse alone saying he blotted their names out sounds like they were written in the book of life and then uh, it doesn't get erased, it just gets blotted out. So the question is, is are all of our names in the book of life from the beginning or when we get saved, you know, the book of life? So when you ask me once saved, always saved, I'm saying it like this. I am saying that Caleb Stegall is my son. He was born into my family and he is my son. And because he is my son, he will always be my son and I will pursue him at all costs. If he decides to run from me, leave me, never talk to me again, and then go unsun himself, reject me, change his name and say, I'm not doing that anymore. He is outside of my blessing. He's outside of the things I have for him. I'm not mad at him. I just, I want him back. And I always want him back. But if he's out there, I can't do anything about that. We see that story with, with the father and the son who left. This, the father always wanted, had his desire for him to come back. And the Bible is unclear that had that son died outside, that he would have not been saved. That, that's not like clearly stated. Uh, and I, I lean toward, if you're a son and a daughter of the living God, you're going to be a son and a daughter for the rest of your life here on earth, and God will be pursuing you and communicating with you. But if you make a hard turn and say, I don't want that name, I don't want to be in that kingdom, I don't, you know, it's, it's not a list of sin that will make him push me away. It's me turning away, because that's what Paul said. It's better to have never known him than to have known him and walked away walked away from so him. I hear, you know, I know I've heard the, the term backsliding. Can you kind of talk about the difference between what you're talking about and backsliding? So backsliding, again, is another church term that we don't find in the, in the scripture, but I danced up here about six years ago with one of your girly umbrellas. It was a sermon, and it was about the umbrella. And so backsliding to me is this. Once I'm born again and I'm son, God has this umbrella that sits over me, and he says, hey, I want you to come stand under this umbrella. Under this umbrella, we don't sin. Under this umbrella, we tithe. Under this umbrella, we don't commit adultery. Under this umbrella, we don't steal. Under this umbrella are all these things that are good and godly and wonderful. And if you step out from under this umbrella, it hails out there. And there's lightning out there. And there's thunder out there. And so, and so backsliding is whenever I step out of under God's umbrella. And I don't know what's going to happen out there. I think sometimes... There's consequences. Oh, there, because... That's a huge word. Consequences. We, we look at God when, the, when we make a choice. And then the consequences of that choice come back to us. And we say, God, why are you doing this to me? It's like little Hadley burning herself, saying, why are you making me blister? I know you didn't want me to touch that fire, but just because I touched the fire, why did you make me have a blister? And you're going, oh, honey, I didn't give you that blister. In fact, I was trying to protect you from that blister. But when you touch fire, it's going to blister. So consequences are often from those around us, from relationships. From, I mean, you know, it's the fruit of our choices, not the punishment of God. Not that God can't punish us. It's just that he doesn't have to because we punish ourselves. I had a question somebody had sent, and it's about um, babies that pass away. So um, let me go to it real quick. What about babies that do not get taken before they know God, even if they've been in church all their life? Yep. So this, there's where this age of accountability comes into play. I definitely believe babies that pass away are in heaven. Okay, I, I believe that. There's a moment when you get confronted, and that's when, I don't know, for each of us it's different. Could be five, could be 12, whatever, when God's saying, I want you to give me your life. When Jesus is saying, I want to be Lord of your life. And that's when... Uh, he starts dealing with us. So the, the children that die, even though 
they're not born again, even though they haven't made the decision for Jesus to be Lord, I believe very much they are covered uh, by him. And, and, and I believe that all the baby, you know, the three babies we've lost are, reside in heaven waiting on us now. Uh, this is a good text right here. It says, blessings, blessings are consequences. Right. See, the word consequences, we think it means a bad thing. Consequences mean the things that happen, the, se the, the things that happen, the sequence. And so when I tithe, the, the consequences of tithing are financial blessing. And protection. And protection. The consequences of being faithful are a better marriage. The consequences of finding a $100 bill on the ground and then putting it on Facebook, you know, to see whose it is so that they can have it, right? Consequences of that are more blessing. And so consequences aren't necessarily uh, right or wrong. Let me read it. Blessings are consequences of being a son or a daughter. And so absolutely, um, consequences are the things that happen because of the actions I take. And so whenever I take righteous actions, good things come to me. And whenever I take sinful actions, consequence, that negative consequences happen. So here we go. Before Jesus, every time you sin, you had to keep a log of it because you had to know how many, how many doves to sacrifice, how many lambs to sacrifice, how many goats to sacrifice based on what sin you had committed. Jesus comes in and he's now that lamb. We don't have to sacrifice anymore for the forgiveness of sin. But where we get all mixed up in these doctrines, some doctrines say, hey, you know, Jesus paid for that, but you need to come in and confess every little thing that happens. And if you don't, you're going to be walking around under this dark cloud. Others say, well, I'm covered by everything, and so I don't need to confess anything. Well, Paul's saying, you may be saved. You may be forgiven. But you're not walking in healing because you've got all this unconfessed sin, and you're carrying it around. And there's even a list of, like, there are some sins that connect, I don't remember it today, with specific physical evidences. And so, like, if you're having migraines, it could be connected to a specific type of unconfessed sin. Or if you're having stomach pain, you know, that's like stomach pain. One of them is anxiety. Anxiety is the opposite of faith. Anxiety is whenever I'm trusting in my circumstances rather than trusting in God. And it comes out in stomach pain. And so if I can get to the point where I can go, hey, I've got anxiety and that's a sin. I can find healing in that. Or uh, I, I, one of the things that happens in 2019 is we're surrounded by all this sin that we're looking at ours going, yeah, I gossip, but at least I don't human traffic, right? Well, the problem with that kind of attitude is that you're participating in a sin, gossip, and it's causing consequences and conflict in your life. And because you don't confess it, because you don't think you need to confess it, because you know some human trafficker that's way worse than you, you're living in the pain of the sin you're walking in. And, and, and so, you know, want freedom from that? Confess it. We'll talk about, as you brought up anxiety, I know a lot of us have dealt with that. I know I, I've dealt with that a lot. So, um, and I, I mean, there were times I just cried out, Lord, please take this from me. I don't want to be anxious. I don't want to be fearful. And the truth is I battled for years over it. So, you know, was that, should I have just confessed, you know, oh, you know, was it, was so, it, do you see what I'm saying? So like, guess what? So was I just... Here's what I think. Okay. I think if you would have found somebody that you loved and loved you as a confidant, a mentor, somebody in Christ and in the Bible, and you went to them, and in fact, I know who it is, you know, if you went to Lynn White, and you said, I need to confess something to you. I'm struggling with anxiety. I keep, I keep doing this. Lynn would not look at you and say, well, that's okay. Everybody does it. She would have given you good, healthy, biblical advice, and you would have found healing there over time. Maybe not the first time. I was going to say, I, almost like when Jesus healed the blind person, and Jesus said, okay, how's that? And he said, well, I, now I see people like trees. Right. And so I believe that there are healings that are a process, and I believe my healing from anxiety is still a process. Yeah. I'm, I, am, I have found much freedom, but it's, there are still times that I, I struggle. Right. So I just, you know, and I don't, I don't feel convicted at this time that I am not having faith or, you know, I mean, I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Speak to that. <laughs> so um, if, if you're not feeling convicted, right. then it may not be sin. 
Uh, you know, right. I, 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 if, if it's or sin, the Holy it's Spirit's going to convict you. He knows what I can handle at what time. Or mm-hmm. some of us have a pet sin that is so common to us that we haven't been hearing the conviction for some time. You know, some of us have some sins that we would even say, well, I was born that way. Or a parent said, I've always been like that. A worry wart. Or I, I was, yeah. that's just who I am. Mm-hmm. We, some of our pet sins, we attach them to our identity. Therefore, you wouldn't be feeling convicted over it because you're just not hearing the Holy Spirit right. over that. Yeah. But it didn't make it not sin. Okay. I was not convicted in my heart. That time I told you about, I demanded the sunglasses back. That I, The guy stole sunglasses from me. I saw him and I said, I want them back. And I didn't feel anything in my heart about that. The next day I opened my Bible and the Bible said, don't demand things back that are stolen from you. That's when, that's when I felt conviction. Sometimes it's when I'm reading the word or whenever I'm listening to my music that I hear something. And I'm, I mean, I'm not, that's when the Holy Spirit's getting at me from another angle going, you're not hearing me right now. So we're going to have this in Bible study or we're, this is going to come up in a conversation. You know, he, I'm going to, I'm going to send this around you. And, and unfortunately, I believe sometimes he allows things to happen to me that I do to others so that I can experience. I'm like, oh, that doesn't feel good. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I need to quit doing that. I didn't know what that felt like. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So when our dogs got out yesterday, I remember I praise God when I was going to pick up the boys because uh, Benjamin and Caleb were out walking looking for them. And so I went to pick them up. And I remember thinking, I did not freak out over this. I mean, I remember thinking I did not have anxiety every moment that those dogs were not at our house. You know, and so I felt convicted of righteousness and that, that I had faith that even if my dogs didn't make it home for whatever reason, that it was going to be okay. And I felt that comfort. So he convicted you, hey, looky there, it's getting better. It's getting better. Yep. Yes. It's I was, and so maybe, yeah. So I, I think I want to close out with some statements here. Number one, this is lots of stuff to talk about. We love talking one-on-one about anything. Okay, come in, let's argue about it. You may find some scriptures or show some stuff, or maybe I didn't explain it well enough, or maybe there's something I haven't seen. And so come in and let's talk about it. Uh, Number two, here's the statement. In 2019, sin is so watered down spectrum, you know, like before I was saved, I was actually working with a youth group. I was 19 and I said this out of my mouth to them. I remember saying it. I said, there's the run of the mill sins like murder, and stealing okay those are the run of the mill sins right that's all sin and we all know it but there's other things that if it's sin to you if if you think it's wrong and you do it it's sin but if you think it's okay and you do it it's not sin like i just had this weird theology that as long as your heart's okay with it i remember you talked about dancing right like if you think it's wrong to dance and you dance it's a sin But if you don't think it's wrong to dance and you dance, it's not a sin. That was where my mind was before I got saved. Okay. And we, in 2019, we live there. In fact, there are some things that are completely sinful that some denominations and churches embrace because they say that's just how it is now. Jesus and Paul didn't know 2000 years. We, they weren't enlightened. They weren't smart enough. And I'm just telling you, sin is sin is sin. If the Bible says it's wrong, it's wrong. Don't do it. Okay. Number two. If you're born again and you sin, your forgiveness is not in jeopardy because your sin's already been paid for. Your um, salvation's not in jeopardy because you're born again. However, your healing, your heart, your mental state, your relationships with people, your relationship with God. Some people, they're like, you know what? I hadn't prayed in two weeks. And I don't even have to ask why. I know why. If I don't, if I go two weeks without talking to God, it's because I've got sin and I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to deal with it. I don't, I mean, that's why we avoid God or we avoid church because we've sinned. And I've even had like, whenever it's communion time, Paul says, don't you, don't you, don't you take communion until you're clean. And so there are people that'll just sit there and not come down. And I'm going, why don't you come down? Well, I'm not clean. Well, how long does it take to get clean? that long it is the moment whenever the holy spirit says you did that last week and it was wrong and you say i know i need to stop doing that now you're clean 
It's not a process. You don't have to go live outside the city. You don't have to get a priest to tell you you're not, you know, that you're, that you're clean again. It is just this perpetual going, God, I see who I am. I get it. I'm working on it. And, and so he comes to me and convicts me of something. And at first I go, but I want to do that. And he goes, I know you want to do that, but I want you to stop. And then at the moment I can say, okay, I got to work on that. That's, that's repentance. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't always have to be a 180 or this huge life change. But many of us have relational trouble because we've sinned against each other and we don't go make it right. And when you have enough of those, um, it's a problem. And so, again, if somebody sinned against you, go to them. And the Bible says if they don't take it well and they don't respond well, take church leaders and go back to them. Or take a brother and go back to them. Third time, take church leaders and go to them. Work it out, not be okay with it, and not don't let that bother you, and not get over it. Here's what's happening. If, I've, if I sin against you and you don't come to me, I may keep sinning against others in that same way. And so as a body, we are asked to go to each other so that we have a chance to make it right, make it better. I always say this. I want the opportunity to apologize. It's robbing people of an opportunity. It robs me. If I've done something I, I do want to know, might hurt my feelings, but I do want to be able to have the opportunity to apologize. So if we look at it like you are keeping somebody from being, and maybe they're not going to apologize, their response shouldn't dictate what you do. Right. What you think their response is going to be. And I'm usually wrong about what people's responses are going to be. Well, get this. You're not going to want to hear this. Probably not. This is bad. So if somebody sins against you and you don't go to them, that's sin. Can we just forgive and let it go? That's what Grandma said. <laughs> I just want to forgive and let it go. He says, go if your brother. Now, I, I, I do want to be clear. This is talking about Christians. Okay. You, you try to take this mentality outside of Christians. They're not going to respond well. But I have yet to have a born-again believer that I'm dealing with that doesn't respond well. And I've had some knockdown drag. I mean, we've had some intense stuff. Go to people. Go to people. If the Holy Spirit's telling you to stop, stop. Well, and usually we run it by, have you ever, I mean, I know we've had that, where we run it by somebody first before we go to them. Yep. I think we're building up confidence. I, mean, I yep. think I'm excusing it. I think I'm, right. I'm justifying. So, yeah, well, you are excusing I, it. I, I am. I'm justifying. Because like now. I just go and run it by my good friend. Hey, do you think this is bad enough to go to them? So I've just. Now it becomes gossip, I'm and you're talking gossip. about somebody else. Yeah. Now, I know Alan, Alan would say this. Some of the versions of this say, if your brother offends you, okay? In the Greek, it is sins against you. We live in a world where. Everybody's offended. Yeah, snowflakes can get offended about everything. This is not about. Snowflakes? What are you talking about? Just go with it. I'm all thinking weather. <laughs> so, they, people can get offended about stuff. That was offensive. That's not sin. <laughs> If they, it, so if I say snowflake and that offended them, offensive. that means they're a snowflake and that's, that's not on me. That's offensive. You're being offensive. <laughs> so this isn't if you offend me because you disagree with me or you offend me because you have a different doctrine, doctrine than me. or you, This is not you've offended me. This is you've sinned against me. And so if it's not a legitimate sin, don't, you, you don't need to be going over that. You need to, you need to get over that. that this is not um, because I'm offended. I don't like the way you said that. If it's not sin, then it's not sin. Okay. But if it's sin and you don't go to them, you're now in sin. And it's going to eat your lunch. Certainly makes my stomach hurt, to be honest. So, the sacrifice has been made. If you're in Jesus, you're in Jesus. Uh, you don't want to walk away from him. I can't give any guarantees outside that umbrella. I don't have enough knowing that I'm sitting here going, all right, yeah, don't worry about it. You said the prayer, you're going to heaven. But I'll tell you, many of the people we find that are getting saved later in life, we found out when they got saved the first time, or so, you know, they weren't actually giving their life to the Lord. They were just in fear of hell, so they came down, and it was just a, hey, 
I need I need to get this monkey off my back. Um, I'm finding that people that get born again later or a second time or a third time, they're going, I didn't understand. I thought I was supposed to come ask Jesus into my heart. And the truth is, Romans 10, 9 says that Jesus needs to be Lord of your life. And now, Holy Spirit's going to clean sin out. And, and don't just, don't excuse your sin. Don't excuse other people's sin. Uh, sin is, is like fire. And it's going to hurt. Last chance for a question. Let me see. I don't think I have any others. Again, uh, this is serious conversation. Would love to sit down and talk about it uh, face to face. Uh, any questions you have or anything we talked about that, that maybe you disagree with. Um, if I've offended you, not really. If I've sinned against you, come to me. If I offended you, go tell somebody else. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> I think it's so important that we walk away with knowing that being sorry is not repentance. Being sorry is not repentance. Although it's a great start. Confessing is the start. It's not the, it's not. But therein lies the beauty of confession to somebody you trust. To somebody somebody you, trust. you trust says, all right, you confessed it. What's your plan? Yeah, what's your plan? What's your plan to fix it? What's your plan to get over this. What's your plan not to do this again? What's your plan to go clean up the mess you've made? And if you don't have a mentor or somebody in your life that talks to you like that, you got to get a better mentor. If your mentor in life says, oh, they shouldn't have done that to you and they shouldn't have talked to you like that and they shouldn't, you know, if they take your side even when you're in sin, that's not a good mentor. That's a worm tongue. All right, let's pray. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that uh, that you just, you take this message, that you take these words and, and you just clarify. Uh, send us to scripture. Keep talking to us. Let, help us to be a strong body that understands sin, that understands the need for repentance and, and, and the fact that we don't have to get saved every Sunday uh, because we've sinned this week. Uh, that we are under your blood, past, present, and future. Yet you're asking us to confess things and to listen to the Holy Spirit that we could be alive and well and healthy and have healthy relationships and healthy boundaries and that we would go to people when they sin against us so we don't cause more conflict and division and confusion. Father, fill us, fill us, and use us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.